because the words are with just a few changes the same. So here we are. We've been talking about the history of the English language <laughs> while we were taking a break, uh, which is a very interesting subject in itself. OK, well, let's go back to Mr. Ruskin. And you'll notice what he says then, picking up where we left off, about modern English art and architecture and design. <clears throat> but the modern English mind has this much in common with that of the Greek that it intensely desires in all things the utmost completion or perfection compatible with their nature. And then notice, if you go all the way to the end of that long paragraph, about the last six lines of that long paragraph, you can teach a man to draw a straight line and to cut one, to strike a curved line and to carve it, and to copy and carve any number of given lines or forms with admirable speed and perfect precision, and you find his work perfect of its kind. But if you ask him to think about any of those forms, to consider if he cannot find any better in his own head, he stops. His execution becomes hesitating. He thinks, and ten to one he thinks wrong. Ten to one he makes a mistake in the first touch he gives to his work as a thinking being. But you have made a man of him for all that. He was only a machine before, an animated tool. He was only a machine before that. See, what he's going to say is that what we value so highly in our modern homes and buildings and in the ways that they are decorated is a kind of design which is purely mechanical in terms of how it's produced. In terms of how it's produced. Notice he's not looking at the product so much as how the product is produced. And the person is actually reduced to being something less than a thoughtful human being. OK? And observe, he goes on, <clears throat> you are put to stern choice in this matter. You must either make a tool of the creature or a man of him. You cannot make both. You cannot make both. Men were not intended to work with the accuracy of tools to be precise and perfect in all their actions. If you will have that precision out of them and make their fingers measure degrees like cogwheels and their arms strike curves like compasses, you must unhumanize them. You must unhumanize them. All the energy of their spirits must be given to make cogs and compasses of themselves, of themselves. You see, this would even be more true of people who work on assembly lines who don't get a chance to manufacture a whole work, but only a part of that work. Okay, So that from Ruskin's point of view, in the old days, let's say we're talking about a shoemaker, the shoemaker would fit you and then would design and would make the whole shoe, or a pair of shoes, of course. And the shoemaker, proud of his work and of his artistry in making the work, would even put what was called his hallmark on the shoe. Now, what if you're on an assembly line and your job is simply to put in eyelets on one side of the shoe? Period. Somebody else puts the heel on the shoe. Somebody else puts the, the last on the shoe. Somebody else puts the, the center of the upper. Somebody else operates a stitching machine and so forth. Okay? And all you do with mechanical precision all day long, day in and day out, is that. Okay? What Ruskin is saying is you take 
people's humanity away from them. And if we're talking about a work of art, as in the construction of a building or the decoration of a room, then we will judge the work of art by how you treat the person who produces that art. Okay, that's the sense in which his criticism of art and architecture is really a kind of critique of the cultures that produce that art and architecture. And so he goes on, <clears throat> a very famous passage. Look down to the next uh, paragraph. And now, reader, look around this English room of yours. Now, we're not living in England, but you've all seen rooms like this because they were much imitated here in the United States at certain points in our history, too. Look around this English room of yours about which you have been proud so often because the work of it was so good and strong and the ornaments of it so finished. Examine again all those accurate moldings and perfect polishings and unerring adjustments of the seasoned wood and tempered steel. Many a time you have exulted over them and thought how great England was because her slightest work was done so thoroughly. Alas, if read rightly, these perfectnesses or perfectnesses are signs of a slavery in our England, a thousand times more bitter and more degrading than that of the scourged African or helot Greek. Well, that's obviously overstating his case, but uh, he may have a point. Let's see. Men may be beaten, chained, tormented, yoked like cattle, slaughtered like summer flies, and yet remain in one sense, in the best sense, free. Well, again, that's overstating his point, but let's see what he's up to. But to smother their souls within them, to blight and hew into rotting pollards the suckling branches of their human intelligence, to make the flesh and skin which after the worms work on it is to see God, into heathen, excuse me, into leathern thongs, to yoke machinery with. This is to be slave masters indeed, and there might be more freedom in England, though her feudal lord's lightest words were worth men's lives, and though the blood of the vexed husbandman dropped in the furrows of her fields, then there is, while the animation of her multitudes is sent like fuel to feed the factory smoke, and the strength of them is given daily to be wasted into the fineness of a web or racked into the exactness of a line. And then he says, and on the other hand, go forth again to gaze upon the old cathedral front. Now remember, he's living in a country in which you could do that, right? I mean, we live here in Houston, and Houston isn't very old, is it? We have historical buildings that people will fight over and say, oh, don't tear down or change that historical building. And you want to find out, well, how old is that? Maybe it's 50 years old, and it's an historical building. Well, in Europe, you know, an historical site may be thousands of years old, certainly hundreds of years old. So you could actually walk down the street. And you'd pass modern buildings, of course, and you'd pass buildings built in the 19th or 18th or 17th centuries. And then there's the cathedral. Gaze again upon the old cathedral front, where you have smiled so often at the fantastic ignorance of the old sculptors, in a condescending way, have smiled. Examine once more those ugly goblins and formless monsters and stern statues, anatomyless and rigid, but do not mock at them, for they are signs of the life and liberty of every workman who struck the stone. 
a freedom of thought and rank in scale of being such as no laws, no charters, no charities can secure, but which it must be the first aim of all Europe at this day, at this day, to regain, not to gain, but to regain for her children. Let me not be thought to speak wildly or extravagantly. It is verily this degradation of the operative into a machine, which more than any other evil of the times is leading the mass of the nations everywhere into vain, incoherent, destructive struggling for a freedom of which they cannot explain the nature to themselves. Their universal outcry against wealth and against nobility is not forced from them either by the pressure of famine or the sting of mortified pride. These do much and have done much in all ages, but the foundations of society were never yet shaken as they are at this day. It is not that men are ill-fed, but that they have no pleasure in the work by which they make their bread, and therefore look to wealth as their only means of pleasure. Now that's actually a very interesting argument, isn't it? And we recall that this work was actually written between 1851 and 1853. What had recently occurred in European history? I mean, a great, huge event, like 1848. Anybody know? Huge, revolutionary convulsions. Revo I mean, political revolutionary convulsions in major cities in Europe and tremendous fear that, that some kind of chaos was going to come to reign throughout Europe and civilization was going to be destroyed. Now, what is Ruskin saying? Ruskin is saying that the reason for this is the way we're treating people. Now remember in our Victorian issues section, which we talked about in terms of providing us with topics for our term papers. One of those topics in that section is industrialism, progress, or decline. Well, here, look at this critique of industrialism. Now, nobody's going to say that we haven't gotten some good things out of industrialism, because we certainly have. But what kind of price has been paid? That's the sort of thing that Ruskin is pointing to here. Okay, um, the last thing that I'd like to do with Ruskin is actually to go back to the introduction to the section on uh, Ruskin. You know what I'm talking about? These, these little uh, prefaces or forewords or uh, headnote essays before each one of our authors, okay? Go to the last page there, that long quotation. What I want to draw your attention to is that Ruskin did a work which was called uh, The uh, Coming Storm of the 19th Century. Uh, <coughs> And the storm cloud, excuse me, the storm cloud of the 19th century. And this is fairly late in his life. I mean, it wasn't at the end of his life. And what he was talking about, among other things, was what we are doing to nature and to our towns and cities in terms of the ecological as well as aesthetic costs. And here we have a letter from the poet A.E. Hausman, who was, as the uh, essay here points out to us, an undergraduate at Oxford in 1877. 
and he's describing one of Ruskin's lectures. Okay, see where the indented passage is? Everybody with me? Okay. This afternoon, Ruskin gave us a great outburst against modern times. He had got a picture of Turner's, of course a picture of Turner's, framed and glassed. It's going to be important that it was glassed, by the way, given what he's going to do to it. Representing Lester and the Abbey and in the distance at sunset over a river. <coughs> Excuse me. He read the account of Wolsey's death out of Henry VIII. Then he pointed to the picture as representing Lester when Turner had drawn it. Then he said, you, if you like, may go to Lester to see what it is like now. I never shall but I can make a pretty good guess. Then he caught up a paintbrush. These stepping stones, of course, have been done away with and are replaced by a beautiful iron bridge. Then he dashed in the iron bridge on the glass of the picture. The color of the stream is supplied on one side by the indigo factory, forthwith one side of the stream became indigo. On the other side, by the soap factory, soap dashed in. They mix in the middle like curds, he said, working them together with a sort of malicious deliberation. See what he's doing is he's got the painting, but it's, it's got glass over it, so he's not ruining the painting. But he's got a paintbrush, and he's painting in what has happened to this once beautiful town. This field over which you see the sun setting behind the abbey is now occupied in a proper manner. Then there went a flame of scarlet across the picture, which developed itself into windows and roofs and red brick and rushed up into a chimney. The atmosphere is supplied thus, a puff and cloud of smoke all over Turner's sky and then the brush thrown down in Ruskin, confronting modern civilization amidst a tempest of applause, which he always elicits now, as he has this term become immensely popular, his lectures being crowded, whereas of old he used to prophesy to empty benches. And again, notice this too is talking about the costs of industrialism as he experienced them in his lifetime. And here we have not only the aesthetic cost, but also the ecological cost. What's happened to the beautiful river? What's happened to the beautiful sky? You see, these are polluted now. Okay, so once again, we have Ruskin as a cultural critic. Well, now let's turn over to Matthew Arnold. Matthew Arnold is also a very interesting guy. And as I was talking about education earlier, he was not only a product of one of the finest educations possible in his time and in his generation, but he also became professionally involved in education, as we shall see in just a moment. Let's see here. I'm going to get out of this. And let's see if we can escape from this. Well, um, Okay, and let's close that. And go to Matthew Arnold. Okay. Matthew Arnold also lived to be a ripe old age. And uh, he was, as I said, educated in the finest manner possible in his time. He went to his father's school, 
His father was the Reverend Thomas Arnold. And his father had developed a new curriculum, a new educational curriculum at rugby, which was a very famous and still is a very famous English school, very prestigious English school. And then he went on to Oxford. Now, in Arnold, what we're going to be pursuing further is, a, is an issue that we've already taken up before. And this is a growing crisis of faith or crisis of belief in the 19th century, which, of course, is going to carry on into the present time. We've talked about this before, in part in connection with science, Sir Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology, Darwin's Origin of the Species and the Descent of Man, and many other works as well. Remember the Huxley-Wilberforce debate at Oxford about uh, evolution and evolutionary theory that's in our Victorian Issues section of our textbook. Well, the new science, at least for some people, also engendered a certain kind of skepticism, at least towards traditional religion or certain forms of traditional religion. The higher criticism of the Bible, as it was called in the 19th century, was textual criticism. And by that, what I mean, or what textual critics certainly mean, is how do you establish accurately the text of the Bible? Well, let's leave the Bible just for a moment and ask, how do you establish the text of any older work where there are serious textual problems. For example, how do you establish the text of Homer? You know, we have various surviving manuscripts, none of them, by the way, from Homer's time, but various surviving manuscripts. How do you work through those different texts and their variations and try to establish a reliable text that is as close we believe, to Homer as we can get. Or take Shakespeare. I mean, some of you will have studied Shakespeare, surely. Romeo and Juliet, there are three different texts. I'm, I'm talking about different versions. I'm not talking about just printed books. Three different textual versions of Romeo and Juliet. There are five different textual versions of Hamlet. Okay, now put yourself in the position of being a textual scholar. How do you go about establishing the text of Hamlet? Trying to get as close as you can to what Shakespeare would actually have written for Hamlet. Now, you can't depend simply on your impressions and say, well, this feels more like Shakespeare to me. This version of a Hamlet uh, soliloquy feels more like Hamlet to me than that other one does. I mean, you, one would assume that you have to have more objective grounds on which to make your decision than that. Now, that's what the higher criticism of the Bible was all about. And to a large extent, the people who were engaging in the textual criticism of the Bible in the 19th century had gotten their training from classical scholarship, from classical scholarship. The scholars who were working on the texts of things like Homer and Virgil and whatnot. Okay? And that's where many of the principles of textual scholarship were worked out that then were applied to the Bible. And then, of course, the biblical scholars learned a great deal and advanced the whole process and, in turn, influenced the classical scholars. And along the way in the 19th century, medieval scholars got involved. So that how do we know what the Canterbury Tales would have looked like to Chaucer? 
It happens that there were over 90, there are over 90 surviving manuscripts of the Canterbury Tales. And they differ from one another. How do you establish? I mean, not wildly, but they do have differences from one another. How do you establish in some objectively determined fashion the best text of the Canterbury Tales? Okay, so the so-called higher criticism of the Bible was this kind of textual scholarship. And what it was doing was bringing into question how reliable the literal texts are. I mean, think about that for a moment. Unless you are a scholar of ancient Hebrew, of ancient Greek, and probably of Aramaic as well, what you're doing is you are experiencing the Bible, should you decide to read it, in some translation, right? Okay, well, first of all, you're dealing with a translation. You're not dealing with the original. And if you've ever done any translating at all, you will know that when you move from one language to another, things tend to slip and slide a little bit, sometimes more than just a little bit. You ever tried to explain something to somebody who's not really familiar with the English language? And you say, well, it's like such and such. You know, well, yeah, but it's not quite that. It's sort of like, you know. And that's certainly true when you're dealing with a different language altogether. Okay? So, first of all, we're talking about translations. And what texts are those translations based on? And what authority do those texts have? And so it became the business of textual scholars in the 19th century, and this still continues, by the way. There are still lots of, of textual scholars working on the text of, of the New Testament, say, right now, even as we sit here. And they don't feel that they've solved all the problems yet, by any means. Okay, so that was bringing into some kinds of question, at least for some people, the literal, the literal reading of the biblical text, especially when one is encountering it in a translation, which may or may not be based on a very reliable text. Okay. The father of Matthew Arnold, as I said, was the Reverend Thomas Arnold, who was one of the leaders of what was called liberal Protestantism, which is a technical term, with a capital L and a capital P, or broad church Anglicanism, the Church of England. But, you know, there's, there's the high church, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this or not. You don't really have to be, but I'll just sketch this in very briefly. Uh, in the Church of England, the Anglican Church, <coughs> or what over here, generally speaking, we call the Episcopal Church, uh, there's the High Church. And the High Church is really almost indistinguishable from Roman Catholicism, with the exception of uh, owing allegiance, the belief that they owe allegiance to the Pope, uh, which of course they don't. So, the uh, but but if you look at the rituals, you look at the prayers, you look at the services, you look at the the teachings and so forth, and High Church Anglicanism is very very close to Roman Catholicism. In fact, in England, it has often been called Anglo. Catholicism. We'll come back to that a little bit later on when we talk about T.S. Eliot, who described himself, the great 20th century poet, who described himself as an Anglo-Catholic. Then you have low church Anglicanism, which is really very close to, say, the Methodist 
church, Methodist religion. It's, it's much more Protestant in, in obvious ways. I'm talking about, you know, you walk into the church and what it looks like and the kinds of services you have and so on and so on. And then there was, in the 19th century, something in between, which was called the Broad Church. And the Broad Church tried to be much more inclusive than either the high or the low churches did. Uh, it tended to be, oh, much less strict about what you had to believe and uh, how you had to believe that and how you had to practice the religion and so forth. And there was a tendency, for example, uh, in the works of Thomas Arnold, Matthew's father, and people like him, to read the Bible as a kind of ethical manual, okay, without worrying about believing in every single thing that is reported in the Bible, to say it, it, it carries within it all kinds of important ethical values and ethical truths. Okay, so this is the kind of upbringing that, that Arnold had. But nevertheless, there's that kind of, oh, doubting, wanting to believe, and at the same time, doubting the things that he wants to believe, which we're going to see running through his works. So let's turn to two poems, and I'm actually going to take these up in reverse order for reasons that may become apparent as we go along. First of all, stances from the Grand Chartreuse. Stances from, from, the, uh, from the Grand Chartreuse. And this is about a trip that Arnold took with his wife onto the continent and is actually his bride. We're going to come back to that when we look at Dover Beach, which is about, to some extent, his relationship with his bride, his new wife. Now they're on the continent. And the Grand Chartreuse is a monastery. And we talked about monasteries earlier when we were talking about Fra Lippo Lippi. And remember what the ideal of the monastic life was supposed to be. You didn't have to become a monk. So if you chose to become a monk or if you chose to become a nun, what you were choosing was supposed to be a life in which you gave up many of the things of the world. in order to cultivate more fully the life of the spirit. Now, there is no group more ascetic, that is to say more strict in this way, than the Carthusians, who are the ones represented here. This is a Carthusian monastery. And you've got footnotes that tell you more about the Carthusians. OK, so. Go to the one, two, three, four, fifth stanza, beginning in line 25. Approach. They're in a carriage, by the way. For what we seek is here, a light. And sparely sup and wait for rest in this outbuilding near. Then cross the sward and reach that gate, knock past the wicket, thou art come to the Carthusians' world-famed home. This is where the order of these very severe monks began. The silent courts where night and day into their stone-carved basins cold, the splashing icy fountains play, the humid corridors behold, where ghost-like in the deepening night cowled forms brush by in gleaming white. Cowled forms? Cowl is a, is a kind of hood. Yeah, which can be, we have somebody with a hood 
<laughs> uh, who is pulling up her hood. The, uh, that's what a cowl is. But the cowl you would pull forward far enough if you were one of these monks so that people couldn't really see your face. Okay? The chapel, where no organs peel and vest the stern and naked prayer, with penitential cries they kneel and wrestle. They're not wrestling one another. This is wrestling spiritually. Wrestling spiritually. Rising then, with bare and white uplifted faces stand, passing the host from hand to hand. And as a note points out, that's not actually the way it was done in these uh, monasteries. But that's what Arnold thinks would have been done based on his Anglican upbringing. Each takes and then his visage wan is buried in his cowl once more. The cells, the cells. In monasteries, the little rooms, which are very, very, very little, bare, bare rooms, uh, consist of a, of a bed, very simple bed, and maybe a table and chair. And that's it. Okay, and they're called cells. The cells, the suffering of man upon the wall, okay, some kind of cross or crucifix on the wall. The knee-worn floor and where they sleep that wooden bed which shall their coffin be when dead. The library where tract and tome not to feed priestly pride are there to him the conquering march of Rome, nor yet to amuse as ours are. They, that is to say the books, paint of souls the inner strife, their drops of blood, their death in life. So these are very severe religious works that these monks read. The garden overgrown, it's not nicely trimmed and clipped and have pretty flowers around and so forth. Yet mild, see, fragrant herbs are flowering there. Okay. Strong children of the alpine wild, whose culture is the brethren's care of human tasks, their only one, and cheerful works beneath the sun. And as a uh, footnote, I believe, in everybody's text points out, uh, these herbs that they tend, this is the only thing that they do, the only occupation that they have, uh, is for the making of a liqueur. I mean, people still drink this liqueur. It's very much prized liqueur. Uh, people drink it as an after-dinner drink. And uh, many monasteries have done things like that. You know, like you've probably run into Benedictine or B&B, &B, Benedictine and Brandy. Benedictine, of course, was and still is uh, uh, produced by Benedictine monks who are different from these monks, different religious order. Um, in Belgium, those wonderful Belgian ales are actually brewed by the, uh, the, the monks, the Trappist monks. Uh, Dom Perignon, heard of Dom Perignon? I mean, maybe none of us have been lucky enough to drink any Dom Perignon because it's very expensive, but it's a very, very, very fine champagne. Dom Perignon was the first monk to have figured out how to make champagne bubble. And for that, we remember him, right? Um, Dom being the, uh, the title of, the, uh, of the, the brothers in a certain religious order. Okay. Those halls, too, designed or destined to contain each of its own pilgrim host of old from England, Germany, or Spain. All are before me. I behold the house, the brotherhood austere. And what am I that I am here? See, he's now going to ask the question, what on earth am I doing here in this monastery where these people are devoted to this very, very 
severe kind of Christian life. For rigorous teachers seized my youth. He's referring now to his father's school. For rigorous teachers seized my youth and purged its faith. Purged its faith. Washed away its faith. And trimmed its fire. Showed me the high white star of truth. There bade me gaze and there aspire. Even now their whispers pierce the gloom. What dost thou in this living tomb? See, his teachers have taught him to be skeptical. So why is he here? What's he doing? Forgive me, masters of the mind. English uh, school teachers are usually referred to as masters or as mistresses. At whose behest I long ago so much unlearnt, so much resigned. In other words, you taught me to unlearn things. And in particular, he's referring to religious belief. I come not here to be your foe. He's addressing now his teachers. I seek these anchorites. Anchorites, that's a certain kind of monk. I don't want to get into a lecture on monasticism here, but it's a certain kind of monk. And these are monks who originally would live in lives of seclusion. Not in Ruth to curse and to deny your truth. You see, I'm not trying to get back at you. That's not why I'm here. I'm not trying to get back at my teachers. Not as their friend or child I speak, but as on some far northern strand, thinking of his own gods, a Greek in pity and mournful awe might stand before some fallen runic stone, for both was, were face and both are gone. He said, you know, I'm like, what if there were some Greek who went up into northern Europe where the Germanic and Scandinavian people live? And you can still find in some parts of Scandinavia rune stones, rune stones, large, some of them very large, I mean, larger than any of us, stones on which are carved runes, which was a form of lettering system. Not, not the same as our alphabet, but it's a kind of alphabet system. And often enough, not always, but often enough, these were religious. But in the old religion of these northern Germanic peoples, Okay, now what if an ancient Greek had gone up there and had been standing in front of those runes? What would he have thought? And Arnold says, that's what I'm like here in this monastery. Okay, for both were faiths and both are gone. You see, the religious faith of these monks, I mean, they're still living it out, but it's, Arnold thought, passing away. Okay, and so here we have one of the most famous passages in all of English literature. Still very widely quoted. In fact, I heard one of my colleagues uh, shouting this out in the hall the other day. Wandering between two worlds one dead, the other powerless to be born, with nowhere yet to rest my head. Wandering between two worlds, one dead, the other powerless to be born, with nowhere yet to rest my head. Okay? He feels himself caught between a world which is, if not dead, dying, the old world of faith, traditional faith, and the other, whatever is going to replace it, not yet born, 
to give him some kind of comfort and stability, which he's lost. Okay? Like these on earth, I wait for in their faith, my tears, the world deride. I come to shed them, my tears, at their side. Oh, hide me in your gloom profound, you solemn seats of holy pain. Take me cowled forms and fence me round till I possess my soul again, till free my thoughts before me roll, not chafed by hourly false control. Can't you do something to help me, he's saying in effect to these monks. This is terrible, being caught in a kind of no man's land, as it were. For the world cries, your faith is now but a dead times exploded dream. My melancholy skeelists say, which is a pretty awkward word for most of us, is a past mode, an outworn theme, as if the world had ever had a faith or schoolists been sad. Ah, if it be past, if it be past, if the world of faith truly has passed away, then please take away at least the restlessness, the pain. Be man henceforth no more a prey to these outdated stings again. The nobleness of grief is gone Ah, uh, leave us not the fret alone. But, but, if you, if you cannot give us ease, last of the race of them who grieve, leave, here leave us to die out with these last of the people who believe. Silent while years engrave the brow, silent the best are silent now. Okay, uh, by the way, these monks took a vow of silence so that the only time that they would uh, give voice to anything would be in chanting in church. But otherwise, they, they would not speak to one another in the way you and I would speak to one another. And in these monasteries, by the way, they developed a, a kind of sign language. <coughs> Excuse me. Kind of sign language so that they could... Uh, a signal something like you know about food or whatever it might be that needed to be signaled. Okay, now let's go back to the poem that uh, precedes this, Dover Beach, which is a very famous poem. You know the White Cliffs of Dover. Okay. Uh, Dover is right there on the southeastern part of England, and it overlooks the channel, the, uh, the English Channel. And it's the shortest distance between the coast of England and the coast of Europe, continental Europe, uh, so that that's where the, the ships used to go, between Dover and Calais in France. Okay. So here he is. And by the way, he's just gotten married in this poem. The sea is calm tonight. The tide is full. The moon lies fair upon the straits. On the French coast, the light gleams and is gone. See, these are lights that might flash, and then they're gone. It's only 26 miles, as I recall. Isn't that right? from Dover to Calais, across the water now. I'm talking about straight across. And so, you know, at night, you would be able to see a light if the light were bright enough across that stretch. Gleams and is gone. The cliffs of England stand glimmering and vast out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window. <laughs> 
He's turning now to his bride. Come to the window. Sweet is the night air, only from the long line of spray where the sea meets the moon blanched land. Listen. Listen. You hear the grating roar of pebbles which the waves draw back and fling at their return up the high strand, begin and cease, and then again begin, with tremulous cadence slow, and bring the eternal note of sadness in. And all of a sudden, something's changed, hasn't it? We've had a description of the night as he's looking out his window, overlooking the sea. But now notice that the movement of the waves and the pebbles that are thrown up onto the shore and then dragged by the tide out into the sea again and again and again brings a note of sadness, sadness in. You know, I sometimes wonder what was Mrs. Arnold thinking at this point? <laughs> you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're on their honeymoon. <laughs> ah, well. <clears throat> Sophocles long ago heard it on the Aegean. Okay, the other end of Europe. Sophocles, the great Greek playwright, who was a writer of tragedies, by the way, not of comedies, but of tragedies, such as Oedipus the King. Sophocles long ago heard it on the Aegean, and it brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of what? Of human misery, which of course is the stuff of his tragedies. We find also in the sound a thought, hearing it by this distant northern sea. The Aegean is in the south, okay, where a Greek would hear it. Arnold is hearing the same sound, but here in the north of Europe. And now notice this thought becomes the sea, but the sea now is the sea of faith. The sea of faith was once, too, at the full. And round earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its, its refers back to sea of faith, its melancholy long withdrawing roar. <coughs> the tide going out, right? When the tide comes up, the water comes up, right? So the sea of faith was once, too, at the full round earth's shore. But now notice the sea of faith is ebbing. It is retreating as the tide goes out. Retreating to the breath of the night wind down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. Ah, love, he turns to his his wife, his bride. Let us be true to one another. For the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really, hath really neither joy nor love nor light nor certitude nor peace nor help for pain. You know, again, you wonder what Mrs. Arnold is thinking at this point. <laughs> Come on, Matthew, lighten up a little. And we are here as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. There are some famous descriptions, by the way, of uh, ancient warfare in which the sun would go down and people were still fighting. And of course, what happens if you're 
in a battle and you're fighting and it's now dark, you can't see who's who, right? And so you're simply flailing around and you may, you may hit your buddies or they may hit you. Okay? That's what we're talking about with ignorant armies clashing by night. Okay, so we are here as, in the sense of as if, as if, on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. Why? Because the sea of faith has gone out. What do we have left to hold on to? Uh, love, let us be true to one another. For the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. We don't have anything to hold on to that is certain unless we have one another to be true to. And that's it. This is not, by the way, one of your most upbeat poems. So, notice how this fits, though, with the stanzas from the Grand Chartreuse. Now, it happens that the stanzas from the Grand Chartreuse actually were composed after Dover Beach, but I thought it might make more sense to do them in the order that we did, because what stanzas from the Grand Chartreuse does is introduce us to the predicament that Arnold feels he is in. He wants to believe. He wants the sea of faith. And yet he's been taught and has come to accept, apparently, at least in part, that that sea of faith is no longer there, or at least that it is receding. And so what does he have left? He has only his wife, and she has really only him to hold on to. Well, okay. Um, Arnold did other things as well. Arnold... Um, was very full of the idea that, as Ruskin said, that there was a crisis in modern culture. By modern here, I'm talking about the, you know, the middle, roughly the middle of the 19th century. And he wrote a number of works, one of them being Culture and Anarchy, but a number of other works as well, in which he attempted to define what he meant by true culture. And what he was talking about was giving people an education and the right kind of an education. Now, he was not himself a teacher in his earlier years, but for about 30 years or so, he was an inspector of schools. Now, what that meant was he went around from school to school to school to school, and he checked up on their curriculum, what they were teaching, how they were teaching it, what kinds of effects this was having on the students, and so forth. And so, professionally, he became deeply involved in education and very concerned about what was being accomplished by education. And for him, it was not simply the imparting of facts, 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 as we saw with Mr. Gradgrind, remember, in Dickens' Hard Times, but rather certain kinds of values, certain kinds of cultural values, so that the truly cultivated person, as cultivated by education, should be, according to Arnold, broad-minded, willing to consider various points of view. One of the things that he despised, that he found, he felt in many of his contemporaries, was that they were too narrow-minded. They were too narrow-minded. 
They were not sufficiently open to alternative points of view, to other views beside their own. And he also thought that these qualities of culture could be best promoted through the study of the great classics of our literature. And so he was a big promoter of the study of ancient classical literature, which was part of the standard curriculum for a long, long, long time. And in many schools on into the 20th century, I'm talking about traditional schools now. I'm not talking about vocational schools necessarily here. Okay, so culture and anarchy, we have a choice. We either descend into a kind of anarchy such as Ruskin was talking about, or we try to recover some kind of culture that will genuinely humanize us. Genuinely humanize us. Okay. Now, let's look briefly at the beginning of Huxley's agnosticism in Christianity. Okay, and I'll give you a moment to find that in your differing and different editions. Okay, there's a work of his which is excerpted here called Agnosticism and Christianity. Now, first of all, let me say a little bit about Huxley. Remember Huxley from the Victorian issues section? It was the one that had to do with evolution and science versus religion. Okay? And there was the Huxley-Wilberforce debate in which Huxley who, by the way, was a biologist, among other things. He was also a person of letters and a thinker and a writer and so forth. But he was, among other things, a scientist, a biologist, to be particular. And he came to be known as Darwin's bulldog because he was also a great debater. And he would engage in argument people like Bishop Wilberforce in order to demonstrate what he believed were the truths of Darwin's evolutionary theories and the evidence that Darwin and others were adducing to back up those theories. And Huxley wrote, among other things, this work, Agnosticism and Christianity. Now, he says, the present discussion has risen out of the use, which has become general in the last few years, of the terms agnostic and agnosticism. Okay, and as the note points out, the term really was uh, coined by Hust Huxley. Okay, and what the word agnostic literally means is not knowing, not knowing. And what he's going to say is that the agnostic is someone who does not claim to know what he does not really know. Okay. So he goes on and he says, you know, agnostics have been charged with being infidels in religion, for example. And he says, well, that's not really what I mean by this. And so go down about uh, eight or nine lines into that paragraph. And he says, I say that agnosticism is not properly described as a negative creed nor indeed as a creed of any kind, except insofar as it expresses absolute faith in the validity of a principle, which is as much ethical as intellectual. This principle may be stated in various ways, but they all amount to this, that it is wrong for a man to say 
that he is certain of the objective truth of any proposition unless he can produce evidence which logically justifies that certainty. Okay? That you cannot say that you are objectively certain of anything as objectively true for which you cannot provide logical argument based on evidence, on actual evidence. This is what agnosticism asserts. And in my opinion, it is all that is essential to agnosticism. That which agnosticism deny and agnostics deny and repudiate as immoral is the contrary doctrine, that there are propositions which men ought to believe without logically satisfactory evidence, and that the reprobation ought to attach to the profession of disbelief in such inadequately supported propositions. Okay, so what he is saying then in the next paragraph is that agnosticism is not and cannot be a creed except insofar as its general principle is concerned. Yet the application of that principle results in the denial of or the suspension of judgment concerning a number of propositions respecting which our contemporary ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical, church, church, right? The Greek word ecclesia was taken over by the early Christians and used for church. Gnostics profess entire certainty. Okay, so what he's talking about in the next paragraph second sentence of the next paragraph is, I do not very much care to speak of anything as unknowable. What I am sure about is that there are many topics about which I know nothing, and which, so far as I can see, are out of reach of my faculties. But whether these things are knowable by anyone else is exactly one of those matters which is beyond my knowledge. And he goes on in this vein, but what he's actually saying is that the agnostic is one who, when faced with an instance of something being asserted to be true, and he does not have the evidence on which to construct a logical argument that it is indeed true, that what is claimed to be true is indeed true. Then he says, I simply have to throw up my hands and say, I don't know. So notice the agnostic is not an atheist. I'm talking about religion now for the moment. Though you could apply this in other areas besides religion. But since he applied it to religion, let me just say that. It's not atheism because the atheist would say, there is no God. There absolutely with certainty, I believe there is no God, or I know there is no God. The agnostic, on the other hand, says, I don't know. And I have no way of deciding one way or another. And that's what Huxley is talking about here. Okay, so notice, by the way, that uh, Atheism really didn't get very far. I mean, not that there aren't atheists around, but didn't get very far because if an atheist would claim that you can't prove the existence of God, it is equally true that you can't prove the non-existence of God. I mean, on what possible ground could you prove the non-existence of God? Okay? Now, by the way, I'm not trying to question anybody's religious beliefs here. I'm, we're talking about history here, okay? And in the 19th century, this was a very, very big deal. And people were arguing about it all the time, okay? Now, if you want to get some idea of how big a deal it was, I remember one time reading a newspaper account that was done in roughly the middle of the 19th century for one of the London newspapers. 
in which the reporter was talking about going to Victoria Station. And I don't know how, if any of you have been to Victoria Station. It's a train station. And it seems like every train in England, this isn't quite true, but every train in England converges on Victoria Station and then leaves from Victoria Station. It's absolutely enormous. And it's very open so that you can actually see lots of trains and lots of tracks, unlike many American train stations. But I want to emphasize the hugeness of it and how at commuting time, when people are going to work, there would be literally thousands of people in Victoria Station, transferring trains, catching trains, getting off trains, and so forth. And this reporter talks about how the latest tract of a group that were called the Tractarians, which produced religious tracts, the most famous one of the Tractarians in that movement was uh, John Henry Cardinal Newman. Some of you may have heard of Newman. He was an Anglican clergyman and, and teacher and scholar and so forth who decided to convert to Roman Catholicism and eventually was elevated to the rank of, of cardinal and was very, very, very famous uh, in the 19th century. And as a matter of fact, in uh, universities like our own, there will typically be a Newman Center, which is the, where there's a Catholic chapel on the campus or just adjacent to the campus, named after Newman. Uh, anyway, Newman was one of the Tractarians. Be this is before he converted to Catholicism. And he was an Anglican uh, uh, minister or priest at that time. And uh, so this reporter said that the latest tract from the Tractarians had come out, causing a great controversy. And he said, it looked as if, as I looked out over Victoria Station, it looked as if virtually everyone had a copy and was reading a copy or was talking to his neighbor about a copy of the latest tract. I mean, that was how seriously people took these things. You see, it was sort of like we might be reading the sports page, you know, or talking about an editorial on the editorial page or something or other like that in the newspaper. And here are people arguing about technical points of theology and of church government, because that's what they were talking about, by the way. Well, OK. Um, it's a different kind of world than the world that most of us occupy. And so for somebody like Huxley to come along, and Huxley was by no means alone, notice what he was doing in terms of upsetting the proverbial apple cart. And to the extent to which these kinds of ideas were being taught in the schools, then obviously the product of that kind of education was Matthew Arnold's stances from the Grand Chartreuse and Dover Beach, in a sense, right? People who were no longer certain. People who were saying, here I am, halfway in between a world of belief and a world of whatever that has not yet clearly enough emerged for me to know even exactly what it is. Now let's look very quickly at a couple of poems, at least one of these we'll have time for. Uh, Hopkins was, Gerard Manley Hopkins, the poet, was a young man who was caught up in what was called the Oxford Movement, which was this religious revival. And many of the younger people ended up converting, like Newman, to Roman Catholicism. To the scandal of their parents, by the way. Would have been one thing if they came home from the university saying, oh, I think I've become an atheist. And they'd say, yeah, yeah, son, you'll grow, outgrow that. 
But to convert to Catholicism, well, this, this really seemed, you know, really far out at the time. Well, Hopkins not only converted to Catholicism, but he came, became a Jesuit priest and also a very fine poet. Now, let's just look at one of his poems, God's Grandeur. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like the shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And though the last lights off the black west went, O oh morning, at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with ah, bright wings. Now, we don't have enough time fully to go through this poem and analyze it. And we'll begin our next session with this poem. But notice something fundamental has changed in English poetry. I'm not saying that all of the poetry that we've been reading up to this point is very simple or very easy to read. And maybe you've had some times when you were puzzling over what's going on here? What, what does he or she mean here? And so forth. And that's why I've spent a lot of time going through these poems, often line by line, to, to try to show what the person is talking about. But notice, just on the face of it, God's grandeur. Something has happened. We are moving towards a great new cultural movement that we call modernism in literature and the arts. But more of this next time.